of large scale commodity production. So I work with uh, sheep and goats, uh, poultry and pigs mainly. Uh, a little bit of cattle, but not so much. Anyway, the, the other four keep me more than occupied. So there's plenty to do in those areas. This is just a very quick uh, outline of what we'll try to cover in the next uh, hour. Uh, so we'll roll through these topics pretty quickly. So why get into poultry production? Why raise, why raise chickens? And uh, it is a question that a lot of people have as they're thinking about doing this. Why, why do it? Do we want to have it for meat, for eggs, uh, as a project for the kids? Chickens are a great 4-H project uh, for kids, a way to get them involved um, and gain some responsibility for taking care of animals. It's a cheap way to get started and uh, to learn a lot about agriculture and livestock production, learning about life, life cycles uh, from birth to death, um, learning where meat comes from, and ultimately um, the idea of you know, having fertilizer for your gardens. If you're raising vegetable production, there's no better manure than, uh, than chicken manure. It's loaded with nitrogen and phosphorus, which is essential for growing good vegetables. And ultimately, um, if you have a small farming operation, adding chickens to it is a good, good business enterprise. It's a good way to bring in some extra income and at the same time, fill your freezer. So this is, you know, if you live in the city, uh, same kind of reasons to have chickens, uh, teach the kids, have some of your own food. Um, of course, in the city, there are more regulations. And so you need to make sure that you can legally have them in the city. But um, whereas if you have a small farm out in the country, that's not such a big deal. So a few, few terms real quick. A chick is a baby chicken and a cockerel is a male chicken under one year of age. So we'll become a rooster eventually if he lives that long. A pullet is a young hen especially one less than one year of age. And a brooder is a heat source for starting young birds. So if you order birds from a hatchery, they'll come through the post office and they will arrive and having been, they will have been incubated at about 90 to 95 degrees for around 21 days. So they're really used to heat. So that's why you will need to have a brooder for them when they arrive to keep them warm. So a rooster is an adult male, and then a hen is an adult female ready to lay eggs. Compared to the word brooder, which is for heating, the term broody means that um, the uh, maternal instinct has been developed in the hen and she's ready to set on eggs. So unless you gather the eggs every day and take them away, a hen may sit in there until they, the ones that are um, fertilized would hatch, or she may sit on the eggs anyway. You've got to take them out. Um, but if you don't have a rooster, there won't be any eggs that will hatch. You've got to have a, a male and female in order to make eggs that are fertilized. So a layer is a bird that is for egg production, whereas a broiler is a meat bird. When you order birds at the hatchery, a straight run is simply a mix of birds, male and female. If you are, um, if you're getting layers, you're going to want all females. And if you're getting um, meat birds, you may want a straight run, or you can get all hens, all pullets, or you can get all cockerels. So you have all those options. So here's. Uh, there's a, a world of chickens. There's hundreds of different breeds that you can choose from, and people have great fun with it, uh, raising chickens. So you can see that there's all kinds of variety in the birds you can have. So they break down into basic groups of egg producers or meat producers or dual purpose, meaning that they do a little bit of each. 
uh, the dual purpose breeds won't give you as much meat or they won't give you as much eggs, but they do really well in general. And after the, you know, after their period of production of eggs, uh, they're a bird that can go in the soup pot because they'll have some meat on them. A lot of the birds that are just layers uh, never put much meat on them. And so uh, at the time when they're finally spent, there's really not much you can do with them. They're not even good soup, soup birds. So egg producers or layers, uh, they produce brown eggs and white eggs. Um, in the meat category, there are birds that are uh, Cornish cross, which are really fast growing. And then there are slower growing breeds as well. The dual purpose, uh, there's a, I'll get into those in just a second. And then bantams, which are just really small. They're miniature versions of all of these other breeds. So they're about a, a fourth to half the size of the uh, full grown breed of the, of the, same, of the same breed. So um, the breed dictates the shell. Egg collar. Some breeds have um, some breeds produce brown eggs. Others produce white eggs. Uh, typically, uh, between a brown egg and a white egg, there's no real difference in in nutritional quality inside the egg. Some people prefer the brown egg, but it's really what matters is what the bird has been fed in terms of whether you know the nutritional value of that egg. Uh, so. Leghorns, they're the most common, common breed in this country, and they produce white eggs. A lot of the dual purpose breeds produce brown eggs. And then the, um, there's a green egg, or what we call the Easter egg, and that's called the Oracana. It's a breed from Chile. So lay, most of the, um, you know, brown egg layers were traditionally more practical because they were a dual purpose kind of breed. Uh, they're hardy animals. They have a lot of meat on them for future soup. Um, they're easy to take care of. They're hardy. They can, a lot of them can do really well in Minnesota winters, for example. They don't produce quite as many eggs, but they do produce a bunch. Um, one issue with them, as we moved into large scale production, is that the brown eggs are harder to candle and eggs need to be candled for aesthetic purposes. You don't want to have a, if you're selling them, uh, you don't necessarily want to have a blood clot or the formation of a chick in it. Um, and so that's, that's one reason that we focused on producing white eggs and they became um, the backbone of the layer production industry. But there are, there are trade-offs with all breeds. Um, you gain product production for maybe less hardiness, um, or you have a hardy breed and, and uh, survivability, but they don't produce quite as many eggs. So it's really just a matter of, you know, what your interest is and what your needs are. So the leghorns are um, excellent egg producers and a white egg shell. They will, they will forage, they'll get out and roam around. So they're not birds that have to be just enclosed all the time. Um, they are high strung animals to some extent and not necessarily good for being pets. So this is not necessarily a bird you would want for the first experience or if you were wanting them to be around children, um, they might be a little more aggressive towards little kids than other breeds. Buff Orpington is very popular in the upper Midwest. A lot of people who are in urban backyard settings or even out on small farms will have the Buff Orpington just because it is um, fully feathered. It's got a big thick body. It produces meat as well as eggs and it can endure our um, cold temperatures. Uh, and it does produce a brown egg, which uh, there is a market for. People love to buy brown eggs. So it's a, a very common breed in Minnesota. Uh, Plymouth Rock is also common here. Um, a good general chicken to be out and about running around. It produces a brown egg. 
And it's a meaty bird as well. So, and if you decide to uh, have raised chicks from it, they have good mothering tendencies. So the Plymouth Rock. Rhode Island Red uh, is a brown egg layer. It's dual purpose breed. Um, it can handle marginal diets and poor living conditions, but you don't want to do that. You want to have you want to have conditions in which the bird can not only survive but thrive. So you want to make sure that it, you're taking care of it as, as well as possible. But it's good to know that it is a um, a very hardy breed. Uh, this bird is uh, quite unusual and just more entertaining and decorative to have around than something that you expect to produce a lot of eggs. It will produce eggs, the Polish breed, but um, it's considered an exotic or an ornamental breed. And they have this tremendous crest on them, um, which is beautiful to see. They're quite entertaining. And um, you may have to do, if you do have the Polish breed, you may have to do some trimming so that they can see because it literally will cover over their eyes to some extent. And here's the Oracana, the Easter egg bird, the Easter egg chicken. And it's originally uh, from Chile and named for a tribe from there. So it gives us the blue, blue green eggs that people like, especially at uh, Easter. Hardy, good egg producer. Uh, the Australorp is a bird that uh, was developed in Australia and produces a lot of eggs. It uh, is a dual purpose breed and yet set a world record for egg production. So this one, um, in, because it's dual purpose and heavily feathered, it would do fine in Minnesota as well. But, and it does produce a tremendous amount of eggs. The New Hampshire Red also produces brown eggs, a uh, big carcass on it like the others. And so it's um, a good breed for eggs and meat production. So we'll get into the meat breeds too. Um, let's see, I didn't look in the chat box. I wasn't able to see uh, who is doing what, but is anybody raising uh, meat birds? I wasn't able to, I can't tell. Um, let's see, I'll have to look at that later. But anyway, this, uh, the meat breeds, the meat breeds um, can lay eggs as well, but that's not what they've been developed for over time. They have been developed to produce a big breast meat and, um, you know, legs and thighs on them that are good, uh, full of good meat. Uh, they, depending on which ones you get, like the Cornish cross, they can be really fast growing. So right here is, a again, a picture of the Cor Cornish cross. And this bird is the backbone of the, the vast meat industry in this country. We produce about um, between 9 and 10 billion broilers every year. And most of them are this bird. Uh, they grow really fast, and they were they were just developed that way through crossbreeding, selective breeding over time, so that they can grow to um, in literally in six weeks or seven weeks, they're ready for market. And when you go to the grocery store and you see most of those chickens that are around four to four and a half pounds, that will be a bird that's only six to seven weeks old, and it. It's the Cornish cross. And uh, so a lot of people like to raise them just simply because they're so efficient and they go to market quickly. Um, other people prefer birds that are slower growing. Um, and, and, you know, one thing about this bird is it's not really that good in a pasture setting because they don't roam around. They, they're, um, they grow so fast, and in particular, their breast meat grows so fast that they will uh, have trouble walking. So they're a bird that tends to um, stay by the feeder and eat and uh, eat and grow. That's what they do. So anyway, they're, they can also eat so 
eat so much and grow so fast that later on, some of them will probably have a heart attack and die. And um, that's literally called flip disease because you'll find them laying on their back dead and their uh, breast area will be all red from lack of oxygen and they have had a heart attack and died. It's called flip disease. And you always lose a, a few of those uh, from every batch, just simply because, again, the, the nature of the bird, how fast they grow. Um, and I've, I've kind of covered this regarding uh, Cornish cross, that they're non-foraging. They don't like to uh, get out and wander compared to other birds. But if you keep them for six to eight weeks, um, or eight weeks, they'll have a five and a half or a six pound or bigger carcass. So these birds really do just keep putting it on. But there are other birds that are slower growing, like the red broiler on the left or the freedom ranger on the right. And so every summer we raise chickens on the, there's a student organic farm on, on the St. Paul campus. And we teach kids um, how to raise broilers, uh, meat birds. Uh, we have uh, 10 huts that are portable and we move them on a daily basis uh, to uh, give the birds fresh clover. They're on a field of Dutch white clover. And, um, and then of course, they're getting a balanced feed ration at the same time. But, and we raise anywhere from 400 to 600 birds every summer. And they go into, uh, we sell them to individuals and also to restaurants on campus. They buy them and, and uh, anyway, they're great eating. So we have tried raising these birds, the red broilers and the free ranger, we've raised it a lot. That's the one we have raised by far the most frequently. And they're um, a very active bird. They love to get out and roam. And uh, let's see, I've got, uh, just a little bit about their background. The Freedom Ranger was developed in France in the 1960s and sold under a, a label called La Belle Rouge, which is a uh, big cooperative of small scale farmers that went together and all worked to raise and sell pastured birds. So they were very popular in Europe and were brought to this country, oh, in the, just in the last 10 to 20 years it does take a lot longer for them to grow. So you're looking at anywhere from 10 to 14 weeks. Because we, um, because we keep them in huts, they tend to grow faster. They're not running around burning up calories. And so um, at uh, a little over, well, let's see, 10, 70, yeah, a little over 11, a little over 11 weeks at 81 days, uh, we had a four and a half to a five and a half pound carcass on those birds, but they do take more time than the, than the uh, Cornish cross. They're also good eating and they don't, they have uh, big legs and thighs and not quite as much breast meat. And so I, they're just, they're really good. We like enjoy them and the customers like them a lot. Here's a bird that, I understand is quite uh, actually ends up being sold into live markets in New York City and uh, called the Kosher King. And it is um, a breed that we've raised as well. It's a cross between the Bard Rock and the Sussex. And, the, and I've been told that the Sussex is one of the really uh, great eating birds, birds, the bird that has a lot of flavor. And we've uh, raised these kosher king, and they do. They're really good eating. They're like the Freedom Ranger in that they take a while to grow. So if you have them on pasture but in portable huts, you're looking at 11 to 12 weeks to get a uh, anywhere from a four and a half pound to a six pound carcass. But like the Freedom Ranger, they really get out and roam, and um, they're fun to watch. Beautiful bird. Uh, the red broiler is an American version of the uh, Freedom Ranger and has the similar characteristics, needing 10 to 12 weeks to grow to that four to five pound carcass range. 
And all of these birds that are heavy foragers have the characteristic of developing bigger legs and thighs and less breast meat. So anyway, good eating. In terms of ordering birds, um, let's see. Yeah. Um, in terms of ordering birds, generally they cost anywhere from one to three dollars. So of course, the more you order, the cheaper they get. So when we order 300 at a time, um, chicks will be close to a dollar. So we add vaccines to that as well. And I'll talk about vaccines in just a minute. But anyway, the birds um, with vaccines are like a dollar, dollar 30 each. And so uh, quite reasonable to get started. They are hatched. If we buy them, for example, from, um, from a hatchery in uh, Pennsylvania, the Freedom Ranger hatchery, they'll be shipped on a Tuesday. They'll arrive on campus on a Thursday. So you can make your own feeders. Uh, you can make feeders out of a rain gutter, or I've done it out of a PVC pipe. Um, the waterers tend to be more expensive, but it's really hard to do without a good waterer. So those waterers you would have to invest in. And then of course, the feed cost is gonna be your most expensive, um, your greatest expense over time. So here's a list of hatcheries around the Midwest, uh, several in Iowa and one in Minnesota and one in Missouri. And I've ordered birds from Hoover's in Iowa and from Welp in Iowa. And I haven't ordered from any of these others, but I know that they are commonly used and people have ordered from Stromberg's and Murray McMurray's regularly and have been quite satisfied with them. The reason I've gone to Hoover's and Welp is that we're ordering large batches, which is what their, their business is. They're really geared towards commercial production. And so, so anyway, they were, um, they had birds available for us. Um, there is this hatchery where we get the Freedom Rangers. That's in Pennsylvania. And I don't have it on here, I should. It's a Freedom Ranger hatchery and in Pennsylvania. So um, that's where we go for our birds and uh, when we raise the Freedom Ranger. So when you order chicks, you, you need to have a plan as to what you're gonna do with them, whether or not you're getting meat birds, the broilers, or whether or not you're getting layers. For the broilers in particular, you need to have a plan developed because they're gonna grow so fast that within two months, they're gonna be ready for market and you need to know what you're gonna do. So if you have a bunch of them, you've got to have processing lined up. And, and I guarantee you that the processing for poultry in particular is getting more and more difficult to find. So that if you wanted to um, have a large batch of birds, and get them processed so that you could sell them, you should contact a meat processor even before you get the birds ordered. Get those dates set up as to when you're gonna process um, and or as quickly as you can after you get the birds because they'll be ready in no time and you've gotta have a place to go with them. Likewise with the layers, they will mature over time. They take longer to grow than the broilers do. And, um, and so you still will need to have, uh, after that stage of growth, when there are little chicks gradually growing up, you've got to have a place to move them into for uh, when they'll be mature animals and ready to lay eggs. If you order all broilers, meat birds, and you decide, uh, like for example, I always get cockerels, the roosters, because they grow faster. You get about a pound a pound to a pound and a half more meat from a, a male in the same amount of time. Some people prefer to order the pullets, all hens, just simply because they're calmer to raise. Whereas the, the cockerels, boys will be boys and they get really feisty. And so um, 
but they give you more meat. And if you're in the business of selling meat, that's a wonderful thing. I always recommend for people to get um, two vaccinations for their birds. One is against coccidiosis and the other is Merix. Um, and most hatcheries will have these available and they cost about 10 to 15 cents each and they're well worth it because um, Coccidiosis is a microscopic parasite that infects the intestines, causes diarrhea. It's very common in chicks up to four to five weeks of age. And, and it will kill a lot of birds in a very short amount of time. It's very contagious. You can, uh, if you can't get a medicate, if you can't get a vaccine, you can use a medicated feed. And at the feed store, the feeds will have labels that will say medicated or not. So if you don't get them vaccinated, you probably should start them with a medicated feed. And it's specifically to prevent um, the development of coccidiosis. And I, a couple summers ago, I had a guy call me and he had a thousand birds at four weeks of age. And in three days, 400 of them had died. And it was very, I told him it's very likely coccidiosis. And he got them tested at a laboratory. And in fact, they did have coccidiosis. And he got them on medicated feed and was able to save the rest. But uh, it's something that you don't want to have happen. So you can treat it to some extent with probiotics or apple cider vinegar. But the best thing to do is use the medicated feed or get them vaccinated at the hatchery. And Merrick's disease, um, you don't see it quite as often in broilers because they go to market at such a young age, but you, you will see it in, um, in layers and it causes paralysis and it is 100% fatal. And so you don't want this to happen you should assume that Merix is everywhere in the environment. And uh, I've even lost broilers to it. I know I have on campus. Um, other potential health hazards is when the chicks um, are, you already got them in a, in a brooder setting and it's warm in there and they're eating. Um, they may develop this uh, condition called pasted vent or pasty butt. And literally what happens is the vent area, which is where eggs and fecal material, eggs and manure both come out of the vent, uh, that liquid in this early stage of life, they're, they're, well, their they're manure is very watery. And then in that warm environment, it will stick on their vent and around it. And it can actually cover it completely and seal it. And if you don't remove it, they will die. Um, so what you need to do is take a cloth, wet cloth, and just very gently moisten up, loosen up the hard uh, manure that's stuck on there behind and remove it. But you've got to be really careful because their skin is really tender and, and it will tear if you uh, do it too roughly. But it is common. You'll have to deal with it in weeks uh, three and four for sure. There will always be some birds that uh, get pasty butt. And I want to mention zoonotic disease as well. That is when diseases that can be, those are diseases that can be transferred between birds and humans. And two of those are Salmonella and Campylobacter. They're very common. Um, every year there are Every summer there are outbreaks of um, salmonella or campylobacter in small scale poultry production. And in particular, what will happen is little children love to pick up fluffy little chicks and hold them up to their face and kiss them and or put them down and then eat without washing their hands. And little kids will get salmonella and it causes severe diarrhea. So does campylobacter. And so you don't want that to happen. So it's all part of that educational process. 
of making sure that everybody, uh, kids and adults, wash their hands after handling the birds and also before eating. And also, if you can get the kids to avoid it, don't kiss the birds. Don't, uh, don't be holding them up to your face. And of course, it goes without saying that uh, you should cook the chicken properly. It's got to be well cooked. Unlike other, like beef, it can't be eaten medium or rare. It's got to be well cooked. So when the chicks arrive, you need to have a clean space for them, warm and draft free. Uh, you could use for bedding wood shavings or sawdust or straw, but wood shavings are really the best. You can get them at any farm store. You should, it should be about 90 degrees or so in the room and you lower the temperature five, five degrees per week um, because the birds are feathering out, uh, replacing the fluffy down that they have. And by about week four, they'll be pretty much fully feathered and they won't need that high temperature. So by then it would be about 70 degrees or so in there. Um, you can use incandescent bulbs. That's commonly what is used. Heat lamps. You always have to be careful with heat lamps because they can cause a fire. So you've got to make sure they're well secured. Um, on two occasions within the last couple of years, we've had uh, the beginnings of a fire in our poultry barn on campus that the heat lamp fell into the uh, bedding and was beginning to glow and we luckily caught it in time. So you've got to be careful with that. You need to have the feed and water set up as well. And, and they will have been, the little chicks will ha, um, have absorbed all the liquid out of the egg before they hatch. And so um, they can survive for about three days that way. But of course they're getting weaker each day. And so they really need water. They're dehydrated when they arrive. And you should um, pick them up and put their, your finger behind their head and literally dunk their beak into the water trough so that they find the water as soon as possible. And they will just uh, drink and drink and drink. They love it. And it helps to have electrolytes in the water. That gives them a little bit of an energy boost as well. But the, the water is even more important than feed at that point. You really wanna make sure they find the water right off the bat. So here is just a small, an example of something set up for somebody who was maybe doing urban backyard chickens and they have um, you know, a heat lamp and a waterer and a little feed trough as well. But that can give you an idea of what it could look like. And of course, the more birds you have, the more space you need, the more waterers and feeders, et cetera. Um, you wanna make sure they thrive, not just survive. So clean water twice daily, uh, clean up the bedding around the waterers because if it gets wet, which it will, then it starts to produce ammonia. And um, ammonia is bad for their lungs. It can cause respiratory issues. If you can smell ammonia, then you need to do some cleaning, but you should do so just on a regular basis so that you don't smell it. Uh, keep the area biosecure if possible. And in hot weather, uh, feed the birds early and late, not during the hot part of the day if you can avoid it. So feed is your um, uh, single greatest cost. Um, Chicks need more protein than adults. Uh, meat birds need more protein and energy than layers do. Layers need more calcium in the diet because they're going to uh, have strong bones. They're gonna be around for a long time. And so um, you wanna have more calcium in that diet for a layer, layer hen. Grit as well to help them digest. I can see, it. I'm gonna have to speed this up. There's just a, a bunch left, but I'll go through them quickly. Anyway, these are some of the requirements that all animals need. Um, energy, protein, vitamins, mineral, water. They're omnivores, they eat everything. They eat meat, bugs, grass, snakes, frogs, mice, everything. 
but they all need a balanced feed ration in order to grow, to produce meat and eggs. They simply won't do it without a balanced feed ration. Insects and forage from the landscape will only give them about maybe 5% of their nutritional needs. So you can't rely on that at all. There are different kinds of feeds that you can buy, conventional or transitional or organic. Organic feed is double the cost of regular feed. Um, there are, you know, and it is, it's not really worth using certified organic feed unless you have a market for certified organic birds, but that's a whole long process in and of itself. Uh, feed forms, they come in mash, which is ground up feed that you can get at a local feed mill. It's usually the cheapest feed. And uh, one of the problems with it is that it, um, the birds will peck through it. They'll eat the corn. They can find the little pieces of grain and they'll eat it. They don't like the soy protein. So you've got to make them clean it up. Whereas when you get pellets, uh, it's all in the pellet. They have no choice. That's all there is to eat. So typically for broilers, they need 20 to 24% for the first four weeks, and then 18 to 20% to finish them out. For, for laying hens that you're gonna have around for a while, first of all, they won't lay eggs for about six, five to six months. So you, you have them as starting on a slower, lower protein ration, and they will always need lower, less protein than meat birds. Um, so a layer, a mature layer will eat anywhere from two tenths to half a pound of feed a day. Of course, they need water. Um, you can offer grit and oyster shell, but if you have a balanced feed, you don't need the oyster shell. So biosecurity is something you want to consider. How to protect your birds from uh, infections, disease that can come from people or animals or vehicles or equipment. These are six areas of um, biosecurity that you should think about. Isolating your birds when they come onto the farm uh, to protect them and to protect other birds that you may have there already. Some sort of a visitor policy around the birds. Uh, you wanna clean and disinfect regularly. Don't haul disease home from visiting other people. Um, if you borrow equipment from neighbors, don't um, make sure you it's clean before you use it, because it could if it's dirty, you could be carrying in infection. And then of course, try to control wildlife and birds and other pests. Keep them away from the feed and water because they do carry disease. So I'm not going to go through all of these steps of ice of biosecurity. Um, but think of it, just think in terms of creating a line of separation around your property, around your birds. That's the easiest way to take the approach, a line of separation. Uh, quarantine them, have up a sign, have people encourage visitors to use a spray bottle on their shoes or have a foot bath there to, you know, with chlorine in it, Clorox. Um, so you'll get about, it takes five to six months for a layer hen to develop and she'll lay eggs for, well, she could lay eggs most of her life, which could be if you kept her around as a pet, it could be several years. But the greatest production is in the first two years and then they begin to decline. You won't get an egg a day, but you'll get about five eggs per week per bird. So if you have uh, four or five birds, you're gonna have, uh, 20 to 25 eggs a week. So you'll have to very quickly find out who else likes eggs and uh, find a place to get rid of them. Um, let's see, covered this kind of and that. Pick up the day eggs daily. Sometimes eggs are dirty uh, with a little bit of fecal material on them. If you can sand that off, if it's not real dirty, if the egg is really dirty, throw it away. Don't risk getting salmonella or campylobacter. Um, there is, um, 
you don't want to wash them. There is there are specific rules about washing the eggs, about the best way to do it. And, and so in general, you don't want to wash them with uh, just soap and water in the house because that actually could remove the protective barrier over the egg and uh, then the bacteria could get in it. Um, you need to have about one nesting box for every four layer hens. They don't all need one. So one, one, lay, one nesting box per three, three to four hens. And the manure that comes from the building, from the bedding, you want to compost it before you put it on the garden. You don't want to put fresh manure, in particular on growing vegetables, because then you're really taking the chance of contaminating them, even if they're going to be cooked, because you've got to still handle them to get them ready to, uh, to cook. Three to five square feet inside a building for a, uh, an adult laying hen. Uh, broilers don't need that much space simply because they, uh, by the time they get big, they're off to market. Um, laying hens need 14 hours of light. And so at, you know, after, as the season winds down, as the summer winds down, you've got to add, you've got to add artificial light and it doesn't have to be much. It could be a 40 watt bulb but they've got to have at least 14 hours every day in order to produce eggs. Otherwise, egg production will really drop. So here's just an example of, uh, this is actually up by Carlton or Renshaw. A farmer has, um, he's raising broilers out on pasture. And this hut is a big one. It has to be pulled by a tractor and he can move it every two or three days. And he had a, oh, a hundred or so birds inside it. The feeders were all hung from the roof so that they just, everything goes forward, feeders and waterers. And it was a hot summer day, but they were doing fine in there. They were a little warm, but not terribly uncomfortable. And you can see the trail of manure that these birds left on the pasture. So uh, they're really putting a lot of fertilizer on it. Uh, this is a small hut that we use on campus. They're eight by eight, and these each hold about 30 birds. And we put wheels on them, and because um, they're pretty heavy, uh, we have we don't use tarps anymore. We put vinyl siding on them, so they're heavy, really heavy. And consequently, we had to put wheels on them, and then we move them with a two-wheel dolly. But, but 30 to 35 birds in these. And we have 10 of these huts on campus. And it would cost about, oh, between two, around $200 to build this one. And if you add the vinyl siding that we put on it, about $300 altogether. But, but the ones we have on campus are so well built that, uh, well, we've had them since 2013 or 2014. So six years and they're still going strong. Um, I like the water on the left, not the one on the right. The one on the left is easier to clean. Here's some examples of what people have built for urban backyard uh, huts. This one actually right here is really nice because you can see that they can get the eggs from the outside. They don't have to go inside the hut. And here's just more examples of different kinds of huts. So some people get really fancy. And obviously, if you're doing this in a commercial setting, you don't need to be this like this at all. Uh, covered that. Pest populations. Um, so predators, everybody loves chicken. And um, on the St. Paul campus, we have hawks and foxes and coyotes and raccoons, and they all bother the birds all the time. And, but the hawks are the worst. And if they can scare one and get it out of a hut, then they nail it. Um, so yeah, that's just something you have to think about. You will lose birds to predators to some extent, to disease to some extent, they won't all make it. 
Um, but you need to do what the best you can to kind of protect your birds, especially at night. Even if they're out uh, ro roaming around during the daytime, they should be locked up at night. Noise, I won't go through that. Processing, you can do it yourself. Or if you're going to hire a processor, you need to call in advance, get that arranged. And that is it. I'm going to quit. Uh, so getting started after today, you know, this class is an introduction. If you have questions, please contact me. If you're thinking about going ahead with this, I can help out um, as much as I certainly can. And, you know, there's all kinds of good books and information online as well. And I include some of that um, information right here. Here's a couple of resources. And here's the hatcheries. Um, this book, Stories Guide to Chickens, is a great one. General introduction to raising chickens. And Poultry Your Way is at the University of Minnesota. It's one of our books. Um, and then we've also got websites. We have uh, a lot of information on our YouTube channel and on our Small Farms channel. But by all means, what we really like is just to talk. So if you have questions, please contact us. So that's it in a nutshell right now. What kind of, uh, do we have any questions? I haven't seen any questions come up in the chat unless I missed some, um, but people okay. feel free to ask us some now. We have about five, six minutes. Um, and you can also unmute yourself and ask Wayne directly if you'd like to, so. Yeah, I went over stuff really fast. It was a lot <laughs> of information, but. Uh, it, no, I know, always have kind of a romantic idea of having chickens and eggs, but it's a lot of work and they really need a lot of care of those little things. So. Yeah, they do. It is a lot of work. More and more than, uh, and that does happen. People in the city find out, well, maybe this isn't as much fun as I thought it was going to be. And so then they give them up. Yeah. But certainly in a small farm setting, they can be, uh, you know, a great asset to the farm in terms of providing food for the farm, providing um, some income, and providing manure for the vegetable gardens. I know one question I had early on, do people give ACV, uh, apple cider vinegar preventive preventatively to the chicks or is it just after they start? Uh, some people do. Yeah, they start them by putting maybe a tablespoon per gallon of water right from the very beginning, um, which the poultry scientist on campus thinks that's not a good idea because they're, they're, you know, their gut is obviously developing and still very sensitive. And, and vinegar is an acid, so um, maybe not the best, but some people do it. And, uh, and I would say later on, it can be really good in that it really helps keep the water squeaky clean. The water trough will just stay squeaky clean because of the apple cider vinegar. A tablespoon to a gallon. Okay, and then Tammy's wondering, do they actually like to eat ticks? Hmm? Chickens, do yep. they like to eat ticks? <laughs> um, yeah, they'll eat ticks. Um, there's a variety of, uh, let's see. There's a, uh, like a guinea chicken in particular, they're supposed to be really good at eating ticks. Uh, chickens will eat ticks. They'll eat all kinds of bugs. Um, as they have great fun exploring the environment, but they may not, they may not do a lot of damage to the overall population of ticks. And Wayne, if you had um, chickens in your little chicken tractor going around your garden, um, what is that waiting period before you would want to start growing vegetables in that plot? Um, well, ideally, you would wait six months or more so that, you know, the last time chickens would have been on it would have been in the fall, and then you would start in the springtime. Yeah. 
or you gather that all up and you put it in compost somewhere. Uh, if if it, like taking it out of a permanent building and putting it into a compost pile and heating it up and and then using it a year uh, six months later as, as a minimum. Yeah, every uh, every summer the center Center for Disease Control will have a report that you know hundreds of people have been made sick and mainly little kids uh, from an outbreak of Salmonella or Campylobacter. And it's because of the way that people handle them and don't wash afterwards. You know. But at the same time, so when I teach the kids on campus how to raise birds, uh, typically most of them anymore are city kids. There's just not that many kids from the country who, you know, who come to campus and get involved with the chicken project. So they're fascinated by the birds. And I've walked into, uh, <clears throat> I've walked into the, the building, into the room where the chicks are, and there'll be a couple of students laying in the bedding on the first day, and they'll be just covered with chicks <sighs> because they're just fascinated by them. So they kind of bond with them, I guess. Anyway, it's hilarious to see. So, well, anyway, that's it in a nutshell. Also, I will send um, some links to Caitlin to share with everybody. And uh, we'll go from there. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Wayne, for sharing all that uh, and sharing your knowledge and your time. I so appreciate it. Uh, and Glad yeah, six thirty, right on the dot. So all right, we did it. Thank you so much, Wayne. That was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, big I, witch. I will be sure to. Um, I have folks' emails from when you registered, so I can send out um, all that information and Wayne's contact info if you have follow-up questions. Oh yeah, everyone, thanks so much for coming and. Uh, Take a moment. See you soon. All right. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks. <laughs> Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> Take a moment.